Welcome to our Summer of Learning series. I'm your host, Phil Zarati. And uh, throughout the summer, we're going to provide you with uh, a couple modules that are aimed at helping you reduce your total cost of ownership. We'll do this by providing you with content that's going to help make your operation greener, more efficient, safer, and as a result, more profitable. Uh, this series is going to be all about asset optimization as part of our Power Institute, which we like to have in-house on hand. Um, we're going to do this via webinar for a number of different factors, but we hope you participate with a number of sessions lined up for you over the course of the summer. We're going to kick this off by learning uh, about some basic fundamentals of mechanical advantage. To help us on this journey, we've got Lee Johnson, who's our chief product engineer. He's going to discuss uh, a couple different topics, power transmission fundamentals, different gearing, uh, gear types, pros and cons, and also gear ratio and the effect on both mechanical and thermal. A little bit about Lee before we start. Lee began his career here in Sumitomo in 1993. And he held roles such as electrical product engineer, cyclo product engineer, chief application engineer, and now our chief product engineer. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we start. We, we want this program to be as interactive as possible, um, but we are gonna keep your lines muted. We would encourage you to post any questions you have in the chat throughout the session, and we're gonna check those periodically and try to address those throughout the course of the session. Uh, we're going to have some interactive poll questions that we'll post at different breaks along the way. So feel free to participate. We encourage that participation. Again, we're going to mute the, the lines, but at the end, uh, we are going to give you the opportunity to raise your hand and then unmute yourself uh, and ask a question live. And then we're also going to stay on for about 10 minutes after we wrap and uh, just give you an opportunity to, to ask any questions or interact if you, if you have something that you would like to discuss that maybe you didn't feel comfortable bringing up during our session. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Lee to the Power Institute and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Lee. All right, thanks for the introduction, Phil. So we're gonna start out by talking about some of the uh, uh, basics of uh, force and work and torque and how they relate to power and horsepower. So fundamentally, work is applying a force against and moving at a, a distance. So for example, if you have a, um, applying a force against a block, you know, apply a force of uh, 10 pounds and you move a distance of 12 feet, all right, then you've done 120 foot pounds worth of work. And, uh, and work is not limited just to pushing blocks around. For example, if you have like a block and tackle system with pulleys, all right, you can, you have a really simple pulley, you can apply a, um, a, a 100 newton meter forces core to move it one meter, and then you've just done 100 newton meters worth of work. If you add a second stage to that, where you have the uh, two supporting ropes, and you can still apply that same 100 newton meters and still move at one meter, all right? And the weight, 200 newton meters, is gonna only move half a meter. So half a meter times 200 meters is still 100 newton meters worth of work. And the same thing holds true if you add another stage. You know, one uh, uh, 100 newton meters work on that cord and the uh, weight's gonna move one third of a meter. And so that will still be 100 newton meters worth of work. So what this illustrates is the concept of lost motion. And this is what the um, uh, gear systems do is instead of um, having a one-to-one -one transmission where you're going 1800 RPM in and 1800 RPM out, you're slowing the output speed and increasing the torque, all right? But you're keeping the power uh, through the work you're doing is the same. Now, power is the work that you've done over time. So the faster you're doing the work, the more power you're generating. So in this example, if you're applying a force against this block, you're applying a force of 4,000 pounds, and you're moving at 15 feet in five seconds, you've done 12,000 foot pounds per second worth of work. Well, let me let me jump in here real quickly. Uh, foot pounds is that the only measure? 
Absolutely not. Um, in other countries, for example, they might use newton meters and uh, or uh, kilogram force meters. Those other measuring systems you can use. You can use foot pounds, inch pounds. So as long as your units are consistent. Work is just a twisting force where you are uh, um, acting across a radius or a distance. So the longer that radius or the distance, the more twisting force you can generate. The trade-off is, is that that little lug nut there isn't going to spin quite as fast the longer you make that uh, distance arm. All right, so that's really illustrates the, the um, advantage of uh, levers, all right? And that's really what gears do, is they just make use leverage to reduce speed and increase torque. So what's the difference between power and torque? Well, power and uh, uh, torque, power is the rate at which you're applying the torque. So if you're applying the torque at a certain speed, then you're generating power. So torque just by itself is just a pure twisting force. And then power is how fast you're twisting. Okay, I think I'm catching on. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm gonna jump in here because uh, I think I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So we, we talked about power, right? And you said that power is equal to or time distance over time, right? Exactly right. Okay. All right, and hopefully the audience is following along as well. Uh, but in our world, we talk a lot about horsepower, right? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm not an engineer, um, but I do like history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that horsepower, the concept of horsepower comes mm -hmm. from this guy. Uh, you know who this guy is? Never met him. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy's name is James Watt. Uh, <laughs> Watt? <laughs> Uh, and, and James Watt uh, lived from 1739 to 1819, and uh, he loved doing math, he was a scientist. And back during that time, you had steam engines that were starting to take the place of horses uh, to do work, right? Mm -hmm. So they were trying to sell steam engines. In order to do that, they had to put that in terms of what the people were using at the time, which was horses. So in order to sell that, they're going to say, hey, this steam engine can replace so many horses or do so many horsepower of work, right? Okay, makes sense. Uh, so Watt was watching work ponies uh, do work, uh, not these ponies, Lee, I know what you were thinking, um, <laughs> but he was watching a pony and he saw that one pony would take about one minute to raise 220 pounds of coal out of a hundred foot well. Mm -hmm. And since he was a scientist, uh, as all scientists would do, he just said, ah, that's about 50% bigger, um, or a horse is about 50% bigger than a pony. So he multiplied that by two, and he found that uh, a horse could do about 330 pounds, 100 foot in one minute, or 33,000 foot pounds per minute. And that is one horsepower, right? That is exactly okay, right. Perfect. 33,000 foot pounds per minute is the definition of one horsepower. All right. And horsepower, power is really the distance to which a force acts in one revolution. So, in this example, if we're applying a 4,000 pound force against a wheel that is four inches in diameter and we're going to spin this over five seconds, all right, then we just did, done a little over one and a half horse, 1.52 horsepower worth of work. Okay, I, th I think I'm following you. All right, now the important thing is, is if you notice, is that the force, you know, is in pounds, and diameter is in inches, and time is in seconds, all right, but our conversion factor was uh, 33,000 foot-pounds per minute. So we have to keep the units consistent, and that's a very important concept. So we have to convert the inches to four-twelfths of a foot, and the five seconds is five-sixtieth of a minute. Okay, perfect. Well, look, I'm going to jump back in again. Just make sure I'm following along. So, Absolutely. Uh, power is equal to force mm -hmm. times distance over time, right? Exactly right. And look, we already established I'm not an engineer. Uh, I like a little history, and I also like math. It's probably my strongest subject. Uh, so for me, this is a math math problem. Um, so let's show what this equation looks like. Uh, now you've already told us force is related to torque, right? Absolutely. And distance over time is related to RPM, right? That's right. Okay, perfect. Uh, now, I think it's, it, it, it is good to say that this is the formula for foot pounds, right? 
That's correct, foot pounds. Okay, so, uh, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit because I, I do know that horsepower is equal to torque times RPM divided by 5252. But we always get this question, uh, why 5252? And, and as we've already said, uh, this is the foot pounds formula. So if we wanted that in the inch pounds, they just, instead of using 5252, you use 63,025. And, and, and why 63,025? Because there's 12 inches to a foot and you got to keep your units consistent. Okay, so 52, 52 times 12 is? 63,025. Exactly Perfect, right. okay. But that question of why 5252, it comes up all the time. Um, so I think to, to understand, we got to go back and look at this horse in this example. And in this example, that horse moved 330 pounds, 100 foot in one minute. So as we already established, 33,000 foot pounds per minute, right? And that is equal to one horsepower. So let's keep that figure um, and let's go back to our equation and look at what we know. So we know one horsepower is equal to 33 foot pounds per minute, right? Yep, 33,000 foot pounds per minute. 33,000 foot pounds, thank you. And we also know that distance per revolution is the circumference, right? And if you right. think of a wheel, and that wheel rotates one revolution, it's gonna rotate the circumference of that wheel, right? Exactly. And if you go back to geometry, we know that a circumference is two pi r, two pi times the radius. Mm -hmm. uh, now the distance per revolution per time is just multiplying that number by the number of RPMs, right? Exactly. Okay, so I think follow me a bit so far. And we are getting some uh, rubbage. I just, just saw a message in the chat about some, some sound issues. So we'll try to keep that minimal. Um, anyways, moving on. So, so let's bank that number, right? Distance over time is equal to two pi times radius times RPM. Now you've already told us that torque is equal to force times radius, right? That's right. Uh, or force is equal to torque divided by radius, right? Just balancing the yeah, equation. Just rearranging the equation. Okay, so everybody's with me, good. We'll keep that one too. Now it looks like we have everything we need to solve this equation. Uh, I'll clean it up with some colors here so you can kind of see where we're going with this. So we have horsepower, distance over time and force. And let's kind of simplify the right side of that equation, right, with, with what we know. So mm -hmm. torque divided by radius is our force times two pi times radius times RPM. Uh, and Basic math, right? We can get rid of radius because we've got it both in the numerator and the denominator. So those yep. are gonna cancel out, right? So let's clean that up a bit more. So we have power equals to torque times two pi times RPM, right? That's exactly right, right. Perfect. Now we know that 33,000 foot pounds per minute of power is equal to one horsepower. Yep. Or you could also say that one horsepower is equal to power divided by 33,000 foot pounds per minute, right? Exactly so. Okay, perfect. So balance this out. We're gonna divide the left side and the right side by 33,000. And here is where we bring it all home, right? So one horsepower is equal to torque times two pi times RPM divided by 33,000. We're gonna simplify that a little bit more because we already know that two pi is equal to 6.28316, right? Two times pi. Exactly right. All right, and then 6.28316 divided by 33,000 is, drum roll please, one oh, divided by 52. 52. All right, but again, not an engineer, no math. You nailed it. All right, you perfect. Uh, so uh, to simplify again, horsepower equals torque times RPM divided by 5252. And if you're still with us in the webinar and you wanna solve for torque, well, that's uh, pretty easy. Move one component to the other side and we've got torque is equal to horsepower times 5252 divided by RPM. Whew, a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, all right. But no, that, that's exactly right, Phil. And like I said, you know, and if you're working with uh, inch pounds and just take the 5252 and replace that by 63,025. So it's a uh, very, very easy, handy formula to keep in mind. So do you feel like taking a quick quiz on what we learned today? Sure, let's do it. All right. So here's our quiz. First question. What is torque? Force times distance, another name for power, or a 1980s dance fad? Well, that, that poll question's uh, in, the, in the poll now, so please feel free to answer that. We're gonna give you just a second to do that. Uh, 
Okay, uh, and it's definitely not a 1989 dance bed. Uh, not unless you're talking about twerk, but uh, okay. <laughs> Force times distance, yes? Okay, that is exactly right. Force times distance. And what is power? Is it bending somebody to your will, a popular show on stars, or torque and speed and work times distance over time? <laughs> Considering there's not an all of the above uh, answer, <laughs> I'm gonna, by process of elimination, go with C. Exactly right. Is it can either be torque times speed, and it's also work times distance over time. Both Correct. of those are the same definition of power. Awesome. So hopefully everybody uh, on the webinar saw those poll questions and interacted. I'm not going to show you those results. Uh, we don't want to embarrass anybody, but um, we appreciate your engagement. We will have a couple more as we, as we go through these next couple of sections. So it uh, looks like we've got a bunch of things here in front of us, gearing. Um, if you could take us through some of this, Lee. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's many different uh, gearing systems or gearing types that are in the power transmission world. Uh, one of the most uh, common is uh, the spur gears. And spur gears use straight cut teeth, all right? And uh, the, when they mesh, you have one or two teeth. Matt, I gotta take that back. You just have one tooth in contact, all right, at all times, all right? Spur gears have got the advantage of being very inexpensive to manufacture. Very easy to make these things, and they're extremely efficient, all right? For a gear stage, they're like 98 to 99% efficient. And efficiency is, really it's a measure of how much lost power you have. So if you put in a um, 10 horsepower into your system and you get 9.9 .9 horsepower out, then you're 99% efficient, All right? So that the lost power shows up as heat and we'll talk about heat a little bit later in an upcoming uh, uh, section. The other very common type is uh, helical gears. And helicals look very much like spurs except that the teeth are cut at an angle, they're cut at a helix angle. And what this does for you is that the teeth come into a gradual engagement, all right? So it's not a shocking engagement, so it's very gradual. And you got more than one tooth in contact at the same time. So you're able to spread the load out a little bit more, so size for size, they can carry a little bit more load. And because they come to a gradual engagement, they're also quieter. And if you roll them on a table, you can actually hear the difference Oh, between wow. helical and spur gears. No, why, why is noise important? Well, noise is important because generally speaking, you want, you want the quietest, smoothest running gearbox you can get, all right? Um, you know, if you have a lot of gearboxes generating noise um, and it's very loud, you may have to have hearing protection. You may have to worry about uh, OSHA violations. Uh, certain applications, noise has to be kept to an absolute minimum. For example, uh, residential elevators, noise is, you know, very, very frowned upon. Everybody wants their elevator ride to be nice and quiet so they can listen to the music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so the uh, next uh, uh, type of gearing we want to talk about is cyclo gearing. This is a type of gearing that was made popular by Sumitomo. All right. And it's a little, little very unusual. With a cyclo type gearing, we have uh, discs, uh, depending on the size of the gearbox, maybe one or two discs. And they are enmeshed with a ring gear housing. And as this eccentric bearing rotates around, it forces these discs into and out of engagement with the uh, ring gear. And then the slow speed shaft is, goes through these holes here and that's carried around and transmits torque. So you can see that in this uh, cutaway, you know, as you turn the input shaft around, these discs come into and out of engagement with the ring gear housing and transmit torque. Now this uh, gearing is uh, not quite as efficient as spur or helical, right? It has the advantage of one being extremely durable because one third of the diameter of each disc is in contact with the ring gear housing. So you're spreading the load over a very large number of points. All right, so it makes these discs almost impossible to break. So, so how does that one third, or I think I don't know, two thirds, but one third, how does that compare to, to regular gearing? It's really, it's really hardly in a comparison because the spur gears, you only have one tooth in contact. So I've only got a single point of contact and so if, there, so if there's a jamming condition, say the machine just jams up or something happens, all right, it's very easy to break these teeth. All right. With a uh, cyclo system, because these lobes, we don't call them teeth, we call them lobes, because these lobes are in compression, they cannot bend and break. So this makes us very, very durable. So these are widely used in steel mills, lumber yards, and, and really, really harsh applications where um, you know, reliability is, is, is crucial. 
The other advantage is that just by changing the number of lobes and the um, uh, pins and rollers in the ring gear housing, you can get an extremely high reduction. So in a single stage of the cycle, you can have a reduction of six to one, all the way out to 119 to one. All right. With uh, helical or spur gears, the best, you, the highest you can go is like maybe 10 to one in an industrial mm -hmm. system. So these, so you can have a very high ratio of gearbox, very strong in a small footprint. The other type of uh, gearing that's in common use is the uh, bevel gears. And bevel gears, you notice that the pinion, that's what we call the driving gear, the pinion crosses its center line of the uh, output gear. The teeth are curved and they come into a nice gradual engagement. So like the helical gears, you're spreading the load over a large number of points because you're coming to gradual engagement, they're also very quiet. And this type of gearing is used in the um, output stage of a bevel buddy box. The input stage uses a cyclo. So this is really kind of like a compound gear box, you know, a combination of cyclo and, and bubble gearing. Another common uh, gear system is hypoids, hyponics. So these right here cross at a point just a little bit, a little bit below the center line. All right, and you got a very aggressive curve on the pinion. So you got a tremendous amount of load sharing. They run very, very quiet, very, very smooth. This type of gearing is used in the rear in, um, rear wheel drive automobiles, right? Because it's very quiet, very strong. So if you got like a 700 horsepower Hemi and you're tooling down the road, you got uh, hypoid gears driving that car. Hmm. The last uh, gearing system is the uh, worm gear. Now the worm gears, they're, they're basically like a screw or a bolt, all right? You have, you just, you know, as this uh, worm turns, this uh, bronze wheel, all right, it pulls it around. One of the advantages of this is you can get a very high reduction in a relatively small package. And above a ratio of say 61, it's also self-locking. So like the other more efficient gear sets, I can grab the close speed shaft and I can spin that around. With a worm system, if the ratio is like say 60 or higher, you cannot do that. It, it will lock in place. Mm. So, so this is used commonly for applications involving antenna drives, for example. Now, you, you, you said it's bronze. Why, why bronze? Well, bronze is um, it's like a second. The uh, very very strong. And if you had say steel on steel, you have to tear these uh, um, things down. Right? You have a little. Bronze wheel, very soft. The drawback is, is that as this uh, wheel, as this worm turns, it's constantly wearing down these teeth. All right, and sooner or later, these teeth will get very thin and they will break. So you have to be very careful about the oil you use and regular inspections. And, and you said they're very inefficient. Why? why very, is that? Well, they're very inefficient because of the amount of sliding compared to the other gearing types. The amount of sliding is very, very great. And what happens is that generates heat. All right, and it lowers your efficiency. So theoretically, you could have a uh, 10 horsepower motor driving this uh, um, worm, and you might only get five horsepower worth of work coming out. So that's 50% efficient. And, you know, and it depends on the ratio. You know, lower ratios might be around 70 or 80% efficient, and then the very high ratios might even be, only be 40% efficient. And we use all of these gears in our gearboxes? Yeah, we can. So for example, the high point gears are used in our hyponic and fortress, right? We use spur gears on the low speed side of our hyponic and fortress. And then uh, uh, of course we use a cycle gearing system in our cycle and bevel buddy box. And, so, and, and we can sell uh, worm drives on special order. Great. All right, next thing we'll talk about is some of the parts of a gear. You know some of the terminology that goes with this. Yeah, I'm just, hold on. That's a that's a lot. Um, we're really going to talk about all these things. No, we're not. <laughs> all right, but uh, there's really about three key dimensions that we talk about with gears that, that are um, important for a user. Uh, one is uh, face width, and face width is just as you might imagine, just how deep the gear is. You know, basically you're talking about the distance across the, across the face of the gear. And generally, and generally, the wider the gear, the stronger it is, just because you're distributing your force over a wider area. 
The other uh, key point is pitch. And that is the distance between identical points on two adjacent gear teeth. So for example, if you talk about a gear that's got a one inch pitch, then that means two, between two um, identical points that the teeth are one inch apart. And another key point is the pitch circle. And the pitch circle is the diameter at which the reduction takes place. So remember that uh, graphic with the uh, um, kid there with the uh, long mm -hmm. lever arm trying to break those lugs yep. loose? All right, that radius all right, corresponds to the radius of your uh, pitch circle. Okay, so the, the three most important things are pitch, pitch circle, and face, face width? Face width, that's right. And, and how do these things impact gear quality or quality of gearbox? Okay, well, basically they relate to the, uh, the, the face width relates to the rating of gearbox. So like I said, the wider the gears, all right, the higher the rating, all right, because you, you're spreading more force over an area, all right, and pitch, and uh, pitch circle relate to the reduction of your gear set and how they will make. So, if you look at this um, next illustration, I talk about uh, pressure angle, and pressure angle relates to the shape of the gear teeth. But pressure angle, you really can't visualize pressure angle as, as on the gear by itself. You have to have two gears in uh, to really explain what this is. So. Um, and you see in this uh, uh, animation, all right, that the pressure angle is this little blue line that's moving. And that right there is the line of action, all right, as your uh, gear teeth come into and out of mesh. And the angle that makes is the pressure angle. And the pressure angle has a big effect on the design of the gear teeth. So in the 1950s, 1960s, 14 and a half degree pressure angles were very, very common. And those have smaller, skinnier teeth, all right, but they're also very quiet. The uh, industry has moved towards 20 and 25 degree pressure angles. Those have wider, thicker teeth, all right, and are somewhat noisier. So, bigger pressure angle is a good thing, or it, it's, it's always a trade off. Okay. All right, it's always a trade off because you go with the higher pressure angles, then you're going to you do have a, a tooth that's more resistant to bending, but it's going to run a little bit louder. But the important thing is this, and it's a very key concept, is that if you have two gears. And they may have the same number of teeth, may have the same pitch. But if one gear has a 14 and a half degree pressure angle and the other gear has a 20 degree pressure angle or 25, you might be able to get them to mesh together, but they will not run properly and they'll wear out very, very quickly. So if you're ever rebuilding gearboxes, it's important you know, that the gear stays a match set. Mm. You cannot mix and match pressure angles on adjacent gears. Another, uh, um, common term that comes up with the gearing systems is backlash. And backlash is the uh, distance between two adjacent teeth. So if you have two teeth that are in contact here, you're gonna have a little bit of clearance in the backside of the tooth. We have to allow for backlash in the, we have to design to allow backlash in the gearing system because as the gearbox heats up, those teeth are gonna grow and that clearance is gonna get reduced. Oh, wait, uh, the teeth are gonna grow? Absolutely. So metals, when they get heat, when they get hot, they start to grow slightly, all right? And we have to account for that thermal expansion in designing gear systems. Okay, that makes sense. So basically any um, common industrial gearbox is gonna have some degree of backlash. The one exception to that are the gearboxes for robotic applications. They're doing very fine uh, positioning where they've got to stop at exactly the same spot over and over again. Those uh, gearing systems have zero backlash, but they're also not meant to be run continuously. You know, it might be able to run them like maybe five minutes out of 10, which means you run for five minutes, then it's got to rest for five minutes. And we have to do that to allow for the heat to dissipate because if those teeth grow too much, then they can bind up and they can wear out very, very quickly. And we make some zero backlash gearboxes, I, I assume, yeah, okay. Absolutely, so that's to use zero backlash gearboxes really in positioning applications. So if you picture in our auto plant, the uh, You've seen those uh, automatic welders that are welding the frames. We have to make the gearboxes that drive those. Okay. Now shimming is an operation where we adjust the clearances of these teeth. All right. So when you have a um, high, po uh, high point gearing or bevel gearing or helical gearing, you know, as I mentioned, those teeth are cut at angles and curves. Well, we have to adjust the clearance. When teeth are manufactured, when a housing is manufactured, there's always pluses or minuses in the machining. 
right? It's never exactly precise. There's always a little bit of plus or minus. And so we have to correct for that in setting up the tooth contact. So for example, you know, if you have, um, you don't want the contact points to come at the very ends of the teeth, because if that's where your load contacts come in, you're actually gonna lever those teeth right off the gear. And at the same time, you know, um, so like I said, depending on the type of machining um, error, you know, this point of contact may be on opposite sides of the teeth or it might be clustered on one end or the other. So what the assembler has to do is he has to check the contact pattern and adjust. Another type of adjustment that needs to be made is with regards to um, the depth of the contact. You know, you don't want the contact points to come too high on the gear teeth and you don't want them to come in too low. Ideally, you want the contact to come right in the center of the gear teeth, centered top and bottom, left to right. Now, now th this looks like a lot of adjusting. I mean, do we do all of this manually? It is a lot of adjusting and yes, we do it manually. So when building uh, systems like this, uh, it, the assemblers, they have to take a lot of very careful measurements. And we try to automate the calculations from those measurements, but they have to measure, record those measurements, and then they have to check and they have to adjust. All right, so it does, is a little bit of a time consuming process, but that's what's necessary to make a um, long lasting, very quiet gearbox. Now there are some gearing systems, for example, that don't require this level of adjustment. Uh, Cyclos, for example, um, have no shims. All right, so there's, they don't have the uh, um, uh, angular surfaces. So, you know, because the lobes are acting straight across, Right, so these can go together very quickly and easily, and they're and they're, they're really the field serviceable. The other gearing systems, for example, uh, bevel and helical, you can service them in the field, but you really need to train personnel, and you got to have the me proper measuring equipment, and they have to know where to measure, and how to calculate the clearances. So it's really best to have jobs done jobs like that done by trained factory personnel. Assuming Tomo has a aftermarket services group where he can send producers back for overhaul or ratio change, what have you, and we can do that, or we can send technicians to the job site and they can do it and they bring the tools and equipment necessary and do it right in the field. Perfect. Okay, do you follow up for another quiz? I think it's time. Okay. So, what is the least efficient type of gearing? Spur, wood, paper mache, or worm? Oh, it's definitely paper mache. <laughs> well, you're right. Paper mache is uh, uh, very, very inefficient, but it's also not particularly strong. So if we take that one out. Worm. Worm it is. All right. And next, so worm gears can have efficiencies ranging from, you know, maybe 70, 80 percent, all the way down to about 40 percent. So they waste a lot of energy as heat. What is the most efficient type? You have spur, high point, helical, or worm. I really wasn't paying attention when you went over this before, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave it to the audience to answer this one. But please. Okay. Well, this the most efficient type is spur gears. Right? So they get up as high as uh, 98, 99% efficient, and helical gears are actually right up there with spurs in terms of efficiency. So. I, I would probably take either one, but spurs, strictly speaking, are just slightly more efficient. Gotcha. All right, so that brings us to talking about gear ratios and gear boxes. So now a gear ratio is just the amount of reduction in speed that you receive in a, the achieving a gear train. Also, the amount of torque multiplication you get in a gear train. So there's two ways you can calculate your gear ratio. The most foolproof way is to actually count the teeth. So on the pinion, the driving gear, if you count, you have 12 teeth, and on the driven gear, you have 36. All right, you draw, always divide the large number by the small number, and you have a three to one reduction uh, in speed or a three to one multiplication in torque. The other thing to keep in mind is that in geared system, it's a very frequent occurrence that if, you're in, if your driver is, say, going clockwise, your output would go in counterclockwise. Change direction can change. Now, what if you have another gear in this system or another gear set? Well, if you have another gear set, then what we do is for each stage, say for example, this uh, um, 36 and 12 system, all right, you have three to one reduction. And then if you had say another stage with say uh, 24 and 
48 teeth, two to one reduction, then you just multiply those two reductions together, six to one overall. All right, okay. Now gear ratings have different, um, so gear systems have different power ratings. All right, so with mechanical power, uh, gears are concerned with uh, strength and durability. And strength just relates to the resistance to bending. So if you remember the spur gear example, okay, as you can imagine with only one tooth in contact, you can get you know, high enough load there, you can get some bending in that tooth. And if it gets excessive, you can break those gear teeth. Durability is the resistance to pitting and scuffing. All right, so it basically relates to how long your gearing is gonna last. The other uh, type of rating is thermal rating. And thermal rating is how much power you can put through a gearbox without the oil overheating. So if you're using a uh, gearbox, say mineral oil, you wanna keep the oil temperature no higher than 95 Celsius or 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So are, are, are you saying that our gearboxes have both a mechanical and a thermal rating? All gearboxes have both mechanical and the thermal rating. However, on uh, some of the, uh, the, the uh, what we call the GM products like Bevel Buddy Box and the Cyclo and Hyponic and the Fortress, the thermal rating is always higher than mechanical rating. So you really don't even need to think about it. So if the, uh, so we just publish for those gearboxes, the mechanical rating and you just put a, a attached motor that's got the same or a lower um, uh, power rating than the gearbox. The large industrial gearboxes, we will publish both a thermal and mechanical rating. And the mechanical rating is very often higher than the thermal rating. And so if, um, say for example, a customer wants to use a 200 horsepower motor and the thermal rating is 100 horsepower and mechanical rating is 300 horsepower, well, 200 horsepower motor and 100 horsepower thermal, the gearbox is gonna overheat. And so what that means is, is that we then have to look at options to increase a thermal rating, maybe an oil cooler, or cooling fans, you know, or something along these lines. Now, is this difference in thermal versus mechanical the reason why we can grease fill some of these units? Absolutely. So, for example, now grease grease is um, does you know it generates a little bit more friction than oil, all right, and doesn't carry away heat as well as oil. But grease has the advantage that a greased gearbox can really be mounted in pretty much any mounting position, sure. all right. If you have an oil system. It's, you know, you're doing a little bit better at carrying away heat, all right? However, um, you have to, we have to uh, make modifications if you wanna mount this, say, vertically or turn it over on its side. And what about like ambient conditions, like the environment, if it's hotter? It has a like huge that. effect yeah, okay. on the temperature rating. So gearboxes, so the, the uh, GM products that you've shown here are referenced at uh, 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So what that means is, is that you can use up to the um, rating in the catalog, up to those temperatures without having to worry about the thermal rating. And if the uh, ambient temperature is hotter than that, you just contact local sales representative or contact the factory and we can walk you through a gearbox selection or find some options that'll make that work in that environment. Perfect. So here's a question for you, Phil. As the ratio increases, what happens to a thermal rating? Does it go up? Stay the same, go down. What do you think? I was paying attention here. So <laughs> down, down. That's right. So as the ratio increases, the uh, thermal rating goes down. And the reason is, is that uh, to get a higher reduction, you know, a lot of times you're increasing the size of your output gear. All right. And so you got more of the gear churning through the oil. All right. And it doesn't seem like it but spinning gears through oil actually generates quite a bit of heat, all right? And so if you think of it like a, for example, a 60 watt light bulb, you know, 60 watts, that's not a lot of power, all right? But that bulb get up to 180 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and uh, burn you pretty badly. So, you know, and the other way that uh, higher ratios can make more heat or low, reduce your thermal rating is that, uh, what, that you can add more stages to your gearbox. So the more stages, the more gears, more components that are moving through the oil, and that generates more heat. Okay, more gears, more points of contact, more friction. That makes sense. Well, I think it's time for a quiz. I think you're right. Okay, so what is mechanical rating? Maximum power 
The gear can transmit without excessive tooth bending or pitting. The hour relate to which your mechanic charges you money. Or uh, how much power a gear can transmit, transmit without overheating. Uh, I'm going to go with A. You are paying attention, Phil. Paying attention. <laughs> Absolutely. So the mechanical rating is just how much power you can transmit mechanically without uh, uh, adversely shortening the life of the gearbox. Now, a little math question, because you love math. <laughs> if the first stage of a, of a two-stage reducer has uh, 12 teeth and 24 teeth, and the second stage has 18 and 36 teeth, what is that overall gear ratio? I'm just going to go by process of el elimination here, Lee, and uh, it can't be one, 186,624 to one. So, and we, we know what A is, right? A is... Uh, it's a it's an Einstein. It's, a, it's an Einstein calculation. <laughs> so I'm going to go with C. That's exactly right. So you just divide the large number by the smaller number. It's two, and 36 by 18 is also two. Two times two is four. But I will say though that uh, with the uh, cyclo product line, they're very modular. I mean, you can stack stages together and give them, I say, about three stages, four stages. We could do 186,000. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I think that's for another session. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Lee, I, I really appreciate it. It was a lot. Um, really good. I hope everybody in the, in the audience enjoyed it as well. Uh, we're going to take a, a pause here and see if there's any questions. I'm not sure we've had any throughout the, the course of the, the session, but uh, we're going to take a pause and see if, if anybody's got any questions. Uh, so we do have a couple here, so I'm going to go ahead and read those off. Um, do you have any manufacturing facilities in the USA? Uh, I can answer that one. Oh, please. So uh, we've got quite a few facilities in the U.S. Uh, we've got some assembly facilities, and then we also have a lot of our manufacturing here in this location, which is, we're, we're in Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, we've got a considerable amount of, uh, amount of manufacturing that we do here. We do manufacture, I think, the, the bevel gearing that we're, we're looking yes, at, we that we do. looked at today. Uh, we also do a lot of fabrication mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of manufacturing on the, on the uh, machine shop side as well. Um, so that answers that. What's the maximum size that you can make in the U.S. and with what type? Uh, so I think that's a, maybe a, a question that's a little difficult to answer in, in well, terms of product. But Well, I, I could say this, that in terms of, say, for example, our inline reducers, we can manufacture those up to, in the United States, up to about 150 horsepower, maybe uh, 500,000 inch pounds of output torque. The uh, big, large industrial gearboxes in the United States, we can go as high as, uh, you know, six, 800 horsepower, maybe larger. All right. And, but that's not to say that we can't bring in from our overseas factories, even larger gearboxes than that. Sure. Sure. Okay. And then uh, the last question that I've got here is, um, and this, we may have to interpret this, but temperature growth for motor, gearbox, and equipment are all different. And how do you put those all into alignment? Or how do you... They reconcile all those things together. If you've got different uh, temperatures for your motor, for your gearbox, and maybe even for the, the equipment. Okay. Well, when the uh, when products are developed, you know, we go through a lot of testing. All right. And uh, so we know that, um, you know, we test these with both our um, gear motor types, where instead of having a free shaft, we have an integral motor. Yep. All right. And we know um, from uh, calculation and testing how much heat is dissipated by motors how much is dissipated through the surface area of the gearbox, all right? And so we know very accurately what the thermal limitations are of all of our products. So I guess what I'd say I answer that question is through a combination of calculation <coughs> and extensive product testing. And, and again, I think I mentioned it earlier, but the application itself and the environment, all those factors kind of come into play. Exactly as well. so, yep. exactly so. Because we, we have to have gearboxes that are used in, you know, our, maybe our, stand, our standard operating range is from uh, 14 Fahrenheit up to 104 Fahrenheit. We've got product that's used in applications that are continuously 40 below zero, all the way up to 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But the, the key thing is we have to know upfront what the uh, intended application is and the conditions, and we can make the modifications necessary to make them work. Gotcha. Okay, uh, we do have one other question that just came in. I'm not sure we can answer this one here. Um, so we will maybe reach out to you 
uh, after this, but the question was, how do we calculate the power for a robotic arm? You know, not sure you can answer that here without. without no, a lot that's of uh, <laughs> that, that is a very detailed uh, question because we have to know. But really, it has to be defined up front. You know, what exactly the loads are, the inertia of the loads, yep. the duty cycle, yep. ambient conditions. There's a lot of things that go into it, and we have uh, specialized engineers that that is all they do is, is answer questions like that. And we're also talking zero backlash, uh, so exactly so. A lot, exactly. more, so, uh, and a lot more engineering. Applications like that could be speed control, where speed fluctuation needs to be kept to a minimum, or they could be motion control, where the motion's got to be very precise as to how far it goes and where it stops. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Uh, well, we will reach out to you, uh, Mr. Sharma, who answered that, or who asked that question, maybe after this to see if there's anything else we can help you with. Uh, okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so uh, we are going to go ahead and wrap it. Again, we're going to hang around for just a few minutes. Uh, we do have a couple raised hands, so we're going to go ahead and unmute one of you um, and let you ask a question in person. It's coming. <laughs> no? Okay, well, uh, if you raised your hand, what I'll say is stick around when we wrap up here and uh, we can talk via chat. And if we can't figure out how to get you unmuted, uh, we can again reach out to you after the session. So uh, again, wanna thank Lee for his uh, participation here and for all the great concepts that we, we covered. Again, this is just the first one. We've got four more sessions that we're gonna cover over the course of the next month. I think we're gonna throw that up on the screen here in just a second. So yeah, we've got uh, some sessions in July, uh, two sessions in July, and then we'll finish with two sessions in August as well. And all this is kind of building, uh, we're, we're again, starting with a foundation with some of the fundamentals and moving through some different, more advanced concepts, ultimately ending with some more asset management to, to help you with your operation. Uh, so again, appreciate the time. Uh, for everyone who joined, thank you. Thanks for the engagement as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your local sales rep. You can find your representative, whether you're in this country or another one, at our website, www.sumitomodrive.com. And uh, you can find my rep or, or find your specific representatives in the site. Uh, without any more? Okay. All right. So, uh, if there's no other questions, we're going to go ahead and cut it there. And again, we're going to hang around for just a few minutes if you've got questions. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay, we, we did have another raised hand and we did unmute you. So uh, if you wanna go ahead and ask a question, feel free to. No. <laughs> Little technical difficulties here with, uh, with the Zoom. We did test this, so we're, uh, we're not sure why it's, uh, it's not able to, to unmute, but we do have a question here. So how many tooth are engaged in helical gearing? Oh, at the helical gearing, it is, they call that a, a, an engagement ratio, and it averages about 1.8 teeth. So depending on where you are in the mesh, you got two teeth, sometimes one teeth, but on average, 1.8. 1.8 teeth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a little bit better than the uh, spurs, which are one, not nearly as good as the cyclo, which is a lot. One third. <laughs> one third, yeah, okay. Okay, I hope that uh, answered your question, uh, Mr. LaRose. Again, we're sticking around if you got any more. All right, thank you, sir.
Okay, no other questions here, and everybody's starting to trickle out, so we are going to cut it. And uh, again, for those of you still on, we appreciate it. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.